Many consider it the most well-known Bible verse in all the Bible, and therefore their favorite. Also the most quoted Bible verse in all the Bible, therefore their most favorite. Also the most loved of all the Bible verses in the Bible because it speaks of God's love and therefore their favorite. Many say it's the greatest Bible verse in all the Bible. And of course I'm speaking of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yet though it is the most well-known Bible verse in all the Bible, and it's the one that's most beloved, it is often the one that is most neglected. The story is told of one of my professors at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, Dr. Harold Bryson, who was preaching at a church. And his text for his message that Sunday morning was John 3.16. And they said of Dr. Bryson that he approached the pulpit, opened the Bible, looked up at the congregation, and simply but profoundly quoted John 3.16 again, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And as soon as he quoted the Bible verse, he said nothing else but to give the invitation. That is, for those of you not familiar with how some Baptist churches do it, we usually preach from a text, and that's why we preach. Preaching comes from the Bible. And we expound on the text, most of us expositorily, some topically. And we preach the message from the text. And then at the end of our message, we extend an invitation to those in the audience to give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ based on the testimony and the preaching of the pastor and the truths from God's Word. And the Holy Spirit moves many times in people's hearts and many people respond publicly to the public invitation. Well, again, in this case with Dr. Bryson, he simply quoted the Bible verse. And then, how long does that take? 15 seconds? 30 seconds at the most? He extended the invitation. Well, people sat there and they were a little bewildered about it. And nobody moved because they were used to hearing a sermon after the scripture was read. And Dr. Bryson anticipated that. And yet at the same time, he called to their attention what they had just missed. And at the invitation, when nobody came, Dr. Bryson again approached the pulpit and he preached on what they had missed when they did not respond to the great love of the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, and the drawing of the Holy Spirit as revealed in John 3.16. You see, John 3.16 speaks of the love of the Lord. And some have commercialized on just the words and the numbers, John 3.16. You perhaps have seen on television when some football games are played and even other sports venues, somebody sitting in the stands holding up a sign saying, John 3.16. You've seen it on t-shirts, you've seen it on billboards, you've seen it on hats. Matter of fact, I was visiting, uh, Carl and I were visiting our son Kyle out in California when he was stationed out there in the Air Force and we went out to the base exchange, the PX, I believe it's what they called a store on the military base where the public could come in also. And there was a man with a table selling hats and he had all sorts of hats spread out on that table and he was hawking his hats as we walked into the store. And one of the hats said John 3.16 in bold letters and bold uh, numbers, simply John 3.16 right across the top of the hat. And so looking for an opportunity to engage this man in conversation about the Lord, I asked him as I acted like I was interested in buying the hat. Did he know what John 3.16 meant? Matter of fact, I acted like I was ignorant about John 3.16. And you know what? He shook his head and said, No, I, I don't really know what it means, but they sell well. 
well, I took that opportunity, of course, to explain to him about John 3.16. And that's what I want to do with you in this Wednesday midweek Bible study here September the 2nd, in the year of our Lord 2020 already. I want you to find your copy of God's Word and turn to John chapter 3. And you might be saying, oh, preacher, I already know John 3.16. I've memorized it or I know it well enough not to have to get my Bible. I want you to go ahead and get your Bible. Always get your Bible, your copy of God's Word, whether it's on your phone, your tablet, or the book uh, Bible. Please get that. And uh, while you're doing that, let me share some uh, uh, information and some prayer requests. Uh, the information is we as Victory Baptist Church are in the midst of gathering up supplies for our Georgia Baptist Children's Home. We've got two homes here in the state of Georgia. And if you can go to our website or go to Facebook where I've posted our worship bulletin for the last two weeks, you can find those items that are needed. Also, after this Sunday's morning worship service at 11 a.m., you're invited to celebrate and attend the renewing of vows of Brother Tommy and Sister Wanda Payton as they renew their vows and also celebrate 25 years of marriage. Isn't that wonderful? And so you're invited to stay after the worship service for that. And it'll be a simple service. There'll be no reception because of the COVID and everything. But you're welcome to express your tangible uh, congratulations to them with a card or something else. And just your presence will be a lot to them. Uh, also, be in prayer. This is going out on Wednesday night. Thursday morning, Victory Baptist Church member Herma Thomas is having uh, major surgery at the uh, Cobb Wellstar Hospital on Thursday morning, September the 3rd, in anticipation of six weeks of recovery. You be in prayer that God will lead those doctors, giving them skills beyond their abilities and wisdom beyond their training, and use them as instruments of healing in His hands to give her a, a successful surgery. And then, would you be in prayer for our son, the one I just mentioned, uh, going out in uh, California to see him at uh, the Air Force, uh, Kyle Cook. Kyle has tested positive for the COVID uh, virus. He's not showing uh, real bad symptoms, although he shared with me today that he's not feeling uh, that good. And he's having a little bit of problem with his breathing, but he's at home, he's self-isolating taking some uh, leave and et cetera and things like that. I appreciate your prayers for Cal. All right, now, you're in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world. And why is it our favorite Bible verse? Why is it that many are drawn to it? Why is it that it's considered by some the greatest Bible verse in all the Bible? Because it does speak of God's love, for God so loved the world. And I'm going to give you an outline, five little points here that God gave me at my first church back in White's Chapel, Alabama. If you don't know where that is, it was between Marquita and uh, Trustful. <laughs> it's this side of Birmingham. And uh, these five points have ministered to me, and I hope that they minister to you concerning God's love. First of all, it's the greatest Bible verse in the Bible, the most loved, because it does speak of God's love, which is universal in consideration. For God so loved the world. Now, love is defined as sacrificial love. It is defined as non-reciprocating love. It is defined as love that is extended to all in many definitions. And that's exactly why it makes it so wonderful this Bible verse in describing God's love that it's universal. He is not prejudiced against anyone. He loves everybody for God so loved the world. And again, I hope you know that speaking more of the trees and the bees, the birds and the, and the fleas and all that's in the world as far as the creation of the world. He's speaking of his creatures, his special creation, man. He loves you and he loves me. Red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight. God loves the little children of the world. And I want you to understand that. I don't care where you've come from or how you may have been oppressed, suppressed, or made feel made to feel as you're inferior to someone else. No, God has no favorites. He loves us all equally. And I want to tell you something else about that. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you any more than he already loves you now. 
and there's nothing that you can do to make God love you any less. His love is universal in consideration, and we'll see that even more so at the end of this verse. It's just packed with so many wonderful truths. So you got that down? God's love is universal in consideration for God so loved the world. It is sacrificial in its demonstration for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And of course, that only begotten son is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's sacrificial in demonstration. You see, the love of God is what's called agape love. It is a love that gives and gives and gives and gives. And it gives so much that it will give its own life for the one that it's showing its love toward. And it expects nothing in return. It's not a reciprocating kind of love. I love you if you love me. No, God loves you regardless. I want you to understand that. I don't care what you've done, where you've been, or who you think you are, as far as in some kind of inferior uh, feelings about yourself, or even shame that you bear for what you've done. God loves you, and he demonstrated that love, and that he gave his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus further demonstrated that love, and that he died on the cross for you. If there had been no one else in the world that, had, that would have ever placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's say that I never placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. No one else ever placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Let's say that Billy Graham even didn't place his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Your grandmama didn't place your faith and, her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Nobody in the world but you would have done it out of the billions of people that have lived prior to us and during this time and the many millions or perhaps billions that would come in the future, if none of them but you, did I say you? You. If no one but you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, he would have still died for you. That's how much he loves you. And I want to tell you, his love is universal in consideration for God so loved the world. It's sacrificial in demonstration, and it's merciful in application for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life did you know that we are all destined to perish we certainly are I told you to get your Bible out and turn to John chapter 3 and we're most of us are familiar with John 3 16 there are perhaps some of you that are listening that are not familiar with it and that's okay you're familiar with it now. That's why I'm preaching to you. That's why God sent me through this video and had you to listen in. It wasn't by accident, and it certainly wasn't the devil that told you to tune in. And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's the next verse, John 3.17. You see, Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's his mercy. Now, what is it that we're being saved from? Why is it that we need to be saved? Well, you've got to understand that before you reach out for a lifesaver, that is, somebody uh, standing on the side of the inside of a boat with a lifesaver, you've got to understand that if you can't swim, you're out in the water and you're sinking, that you're about to perish, right? And so you call out for salvation. You call out for somebody to save you, to deliver you, to jump in to get you, or throw that lifesaver. Well, Jesus is our lifesaver, and the reason we're sinking is because of something called sin. You and I are sinners. I may have never met you, and I may never meet you. And this may be the first time you've ever listened to me, and you may never meet me face to face. But there's one thing that both of us can know for sure about one another. We're both sinners. We have transgressed the law of God. And if you wanted just a summary of that, go find the Ten Commandments in Exodus and also in Deuteronomy where they're repeated in all the laws in the Bible. And you just look there and everywhere it says, Thou shall not, and you just say, Well, I have. And where it says, Thou shall, you just have to say, Well, I haven't all the time. Anytime we transgress, break God's law, we really don't break the law. The law stands. Uh, you go down the highway and you go over the speed limit and you say, I broke the law. No, 
The law still stands. <laughs> you transgressed against the law. And the law is going to find you guilty just like God's law finds you guilty. And that's called sin. And our sin brings us under condemnation. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That is, if we don't give our lives to Jesus Christ, we remain under the condemnation. God doesn't have to condemn us. Listen to this very carefully. We stand condemned already. And you need to understand that. And I had to understand that one time. said, if I didn't do anything about my sin, I was already under the law condemned. And that law and condemnation weighed heavily on me. And all I had to do was drop dead right then. I would have spent eternity in the place called hell. And you will too if you don't place your faith and trust in Jesus. And everybody else will. But again... It's merciful, the love of God, in application because you don't have to stay condemned. For God sent his Son in the world to, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed them should not perish. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to perish. You don't have to go to hell. People in hell have not gone to hell because of a ruthless God who has condemned them in their sin. They have gone to hell because they have turned their nose up to the mercy of God and said, I will live my life the way I want to. There is no condemnation. I'll be my own man. I'll do my own thing. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And then they die in that sin. They stand before God in the judgment and they stand condemned because they did not place their faith and trust in Jesus, the only one who could save them from their sin. Oh, it's merciful in application. And you see, mercy is something we don't deserve. God's grace is something that he gives us when we don't deserve it. Mercy is also God's gift to us when he doesn't punish us when we do deserve it. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, God demonstrated his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. He showed mercy to us. You see, you can't pay for your own sin. You're already condemned. I don't care how good you live from now on. You can't undo what you've already done. Suppose, suppose a man is is found to be a murderer and he stands before God uh, before judge and he pleads for the judge he says listen judge just let me go and I'll never murder again and I'll be a good guy for the rest of my life well the judge says that may be so but you've got to pay for the sin you've already committed and you see that's what we have to do and we can't pay for it unless we pay for it in eternity in hell and that's how bad sin is and the badness of our sin was demonstrated in the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ in that he gave his life in our place. So you got that? First three things. God's love is universal in consideration for God's love of the world. It is sacrificial in its demonstration that he gave his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that it's merciful in its application that is it's sacrificial demonstration merciful in its application that you should not perish and it's eternal now in its duration that we should not perish but have everlasting life now how long is everlasting <laughs> it's everlasting it's forever and ever how long is forever it's forever and ever that's the kind of life that Jesus comes to give us now it's not only eternal but it, it is also abundant life. John, uh, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. That's life right now. He can give us joy even in the midst of the turmoil that we live in in this world. He can give us a joy that's inside. You see, the joy of the Lord is an inside job. I can have joy even when things around me are not joyful. I can have the peace of God which surpasses all understanding and guards my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus even when the world around me is falling apart 
And I want to remind you, if you haven't uh, looked outside and you've been living under a rock, the world is falling apart and it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. And if you don't have the peace of God, you're at the mercy of what this world has to offer. And I want to give you and inform you of some news. This world doesn't have anything to offer us. And it's best. It's only temporary. And this world won't help you get into the world to come. This world is going to be condemned one day. But Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You've got to go through Jesus. And Jesus says in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And he who comes to the Father must come by me. You've got to go through Jesus. Not through the Baptist Church, Methodist Church, Presbyterian Church, the Catholic Church. Not by your good works, not by your prayers, not giving your money, not because of who you are and who you was born to. You've got to go through Jesus. And that's why God loved the world so much that he didn't send us a politician. Amen? He didn't send us a committee. He sent us Jesus. And Jesus is who we need. And it's Jesus who saves from sin. No one else. And put your faith wholly, solely, fully, entirely in Jesus. Jesus. Oh, what a name. And God's love is demonstrated in him. It's universal in consideration. Sacrificial in demonstration. Merciful in application. Eternal in duration. And personal in invitation that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm trying to tell you this verse is for you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That whosoever believeth in him should be saved, will be saved. Whosoever, that's anybody, any place, any time that could be you right now where you are and you know this video will go out and some will listen to it and some won't even get this far they'll cut it off even church members but others will listen because they need a savior and you've stuck with me this long haven't you about 22, 23 minutes. Thank you. But if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll be thanking me. <laughs> you'll be shouting his name from the mountaintops. And you can right now. Because God loves you. You're part of the world that he made. God showed his love to you and that he sent his very best, the Lord Jesus Christ. God extends his mercy to you right now. You don't have to perish. You're already under condemnation. Remember that. You've already sinned. You're already guilty. You need a way out, and you can't do it. And he offers you not only eternal life in heaven with him, but an abundant life right now. You can have that life. If you, the whosoever in the whosoever will, would place your faith and trust in him. And you can do that right now. You can come confessing to the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to confess to me or anybody else. I can't save you, but God can through His Son Jesus. And that's the one you need to go through, go to. And you just simply say to Him something like this. You say, Heavenly Father, I know that I've sinned against you. You know I've sinned against you. I'm just agreeing with you and what you already know about me. And I'm, I'm coming to my senses. And, and in the best I know how in my heart, I'm sorry. And I'm so sorry that I'm going to turn from my sin. And I'm going to get into your word and find out what is sin and what, how you want me to live. And I'm going to turn from that sin too. And the more I get closer to you, the closer I get to you, it's like getting closer to the light. The more filth that you reveal in my, my life because you're the light. And I'm not going to shy away from it. I'm going to get closer and closer to you because I want to live for you. And I'm going to ask you, Lord, to have mercy on me to forgive me my sin because I am a sinner and I turn from that sin the Bible calls that repentance and you pray prayer for like, like that and say Lord I'm a sinner and I'm turning from my sin I'm not only sorry for it I'm going to turn from it 
and I'm going to turn to Jesus and I'm going to put my faith where you place my sin on Jesus for he died for me on that cross you sent him into the world not to condemn the world that includes me and I don't want to be condemned I want a way out and I'm placing my faith and trust in Jesus and if you'll do that then John 3.16 will become the greatest Bible verse for you too for God so loved the world you that he sent his only begotten son for you that whosoever you believe in him should not perish you don't have to go to hell but you can have everlasting life would you pray that prayer right now can I lead you in it heavenly father as we bow our heads right now before you we thank you for loving us we thank you Lord that you loved us enough to show it in sending your son Jesus we thank you Lord that your love is a merciful love that we should not perish and that it's an eternal love that we should not perish but have everlasting life that begins right now with your abundant life and that Lord it is a personal love that whosoever should believe in him should not perish and Lord this dear precious soul that is praying with me right now I pray Lord that you would confirm in their heart by the presence and the power and the peace of your Holy Spirit that they belong to you now that they've been born again just as the beginning of this chapter 3 starts Lord and Father I pray that they will get into your word and your word will get into them and that Father they will live now in sharing your love with others for Father you so love the world and we pray it in Jesus name your blessed son our Lord and Savior, and our soon coming King. Amen and amen. God bless you. If you prayed that prayer, would you try to get in touch with me? You have some comments you can make there on the YouTube page, other ways. Victory Baptist Church in Douglasville, Georgia, and you can look us up on the uh, internet webpage. And I'd love to hear from you. But that's okay if you can't. Just tell somebody about the love of Jesus. And don't forget to thank God for his love towards you. God bless you and God keep you.